And before we uh, read, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the word of God. It is truly, Lord, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, it is truly truth. We thank you, Lord, that in this world of uncertainty, confusion, craziness, waves of lies, that there is an anchor for our soul. There is a basis of eternal, absolute truth, the Word of God. I bless and praise your name for that this morning, Lord, that you've not only given us your Word, but you've preserved your Word. It's a joy to me, Lord, to know that my descendants, my great-grandchildren, will have a Bible because you've preserved your Word. I pray, God, today that we would live by this book, by your grace. I pray, God, today that you help us to glean from it, to feed on it, I pray, Lord, for the salvation of souls. I pray, Lord, that there'll be conversions here this morning for your glory and for your namesake. I pray that hell would be robbed. I pray, God, that you help me to preach clearly, concisely, and, Lord, with a burden. I pray, God, today that this message will help folks. I pray, God, to help them. Lord, every day of their life, they're making choices. They're making decisions every day. And those decisions and choices, the Lord, are affecting uh, their life. In a mighty way. And I pray, God, that you would help us this morning to realize the importance of making wise choices. And so, Lord, we just give this service to you and we rejoice in you and rest in you. And we worship you this morning. And we ascribe to you all glory and all honor, all praise and all worship. And, Lord, we just want to bless your holy name. Amen and amen. Good to see everybody out this morning. It is one beautiful day in the Ozarks, isn't it? My goodness sakes alive, it is nice out. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, <clears throat> we're going to uh, pick it up, at, uh, let's just kick it in verse number 1. And then we'll, this is the, we've preached on the, we're preaching on the, through the life of David. Let me say something to you about the life of David. Uh, you know, I'm not just going to every Sunday or every Sunday night preach on David's life, but I will tell you this is going to last a long time. David's one of the most prominent people in the Bible. And David's life affects every realm of life that you can possibly imagine having affected. And there's just so many things that comes into play. And God has so much to teach us and guide us and give us wisdom about. So sometimes when you think, oh man, he's preaching on this. How's this connected to David? But it is. And just hang in there. The Lord said unto Samuel, chapter 16, everybody there say amen. amen. And the Lord said unto Samuel, how long without mourn for Saul, seeing I've rejected him, from reigning over Israel, fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear, hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel said that which the Lord spake. Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. Now what that word sanctify there means that he set them apart unto the Lord, Jesse's sons. He knew that out of Jesse's sons, he was supposed to anoint one of his boys. And he set them apart unto the Lord at this sacrifice. But he didn't know which boy it was yet. And he's going to make a choice here pretty soon. And so let's continue reading the scene here. And verse number 6. And it came to pass when they were come, Jesse's family, he brought Jesse and his sons. When they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance. Or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, now watch the verbiage here. Neither hath the Lord chosen this. I want you to underline that phrase. Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Verse 9, then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, here it is again, neither hath the Lord chosen this. And again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen thee. Three times 
uh, it is written, more times not written, but three times it's written, the Lord has not chosen this. Then verse number 11, Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remainest yet the youngest. Behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with all of a beautiful countenance, good little look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. I want to preach a message today on the power and the consequence of choices. Every day of my life, I make choices. Hundreds of them, even sometimes in one day. You're going to make choices right here in this service today. You're, you're, make, you're going to make choices while I'm preaching. You're going to make choices before you go out that door. Life is a continual sequence of, of choices. Those three verses I want to take my text from is, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. And I want to preach on the consequences of choices and learning to choose wisely in life. As I said, life is a constant, continual series of choices. And these choices that we make set us on a course, and it determines direction. It has been said that choices determine destiny, and, it do, and they do. There is the truth of the sovereignty of God, and I want to do this on the early part of this message. There is the truth of the sovereignty of God, the overriding providence of God in history. I hope you, I hope you listen to this today. I hope you just won't sit there and let it glide through. I hope you'll listen to this. There is the truth of God's providence over mankind and over history. But within that providence, we have the privilege and the responsibility of making choices. We are not robots. We are people whom God has given the right and the privilege and the responsibility to make choices. And as the older I get, the farther I go and I watch my own life and the life of other people, and I see the devastating consequences of wrong choices. Wrong decisions made that determine the whole direction and course of their life from right on through. You see people suffering the consequences of unwise choices. And it begins to dawn on me how important choices are. And when I read this account, I believe God is telling us as Christians to look back and learn from the Old Testament. Be very, very careful about your choices. Samuel went one after another, and the Lord kept saying, The Lord hasn't chose this. 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 And I'm going to tell you, I look at that and I say, Oh my God, I wish I'd have got a hold of this 35, 40 years ago. Reggie, slow down. Don't be such a rush to make a choice. Be sure you're listening to the voice of God when you're making those decisions. There is that sovereignty of God, but again, as I say, God made it where we make choices in the midst of that. The great secret here shown, the great principle that's shown is this, is that you and I need to make our choices based upon the mind of God and the word of God. And I, I know that's simple. You may say, Reg, you already know that, but do we really know that? And are we practicing that day by day? That when a choice comes to us that we have to make, that we're going to seek the word of God and the mind of God about that choice. I mean, to tell you what, it, it, that we are constantly, nonstop making choices. We're going to live with now and in eternity the choices that we make. In every arena of life and in every issue of life, we must make choices. The old boy has said, you don't have a choice about it. You're going to make choices. The Bible is a book. As I begin to meditate on this the last two or three weeks, I've actually been working on this message for two or three, four weeks, actually. As I begin to think about it, meditate in the Bible, Brother Ralph, all of a sudden it dawned on me the Bible is just one great big book about people's choices. From beginning to end, it is about, not, not to say it's not about Christ and his redemptive work, but as far as you and I are practically concerned, 
This Bible is full of people who constantly made choices. And God recorded those choices and the ramifications and end of those choices so that you and I could benefit and profit from them. You say, Reggie, give me some Bible examples. Right out of the hatch, Eve made a choice. She was presented with a choice whether to eat of that fruit or not to eat of it. A choice to obey God or not to obey God. And did you know she sent the whole human race into damnation because of one choice that she made? God's telling us right off the bat, choices are important. They're going to affect not just you, but everybody around you. They're going to affect people everywhere, the choices that you make. America just had an election. We just made a choice. And it's going to affect thousands and millions of people. It'll affect people overseas. It'll affect all kinds of things. Eve made a choice. We continue reading our Bible and find out that Abel made a choice. He had a choice. Him and Cain both had a choice whether to bring God a blood sacrifice or to bring God the works of their hands. And Abel made a choice to bring God blood sacrifice. But do you know what that choice brought him? It brought him death. Because Cain killed him and Cain made a choice to bring the works of his hands. People across the world today are making a choice between coming to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God and his blood and bringing that to God the Father as their sacrifice or to bring the works of their hands and their own self-righteousness. And to this day, to this day again, you will be affected in your, by those people who make those choices around you and your choice. And then there's Noah. If there's ever a man made a choice, Noah made a choice. Noah made a choice to believe God when it seemed impossible. It had never rained on the earth before. It, it made him look like an idiot. It made him look like a fanatic. It made him look like he was over the top. It made him look like he'd lost his mind. But Noah made a choice. And Noah's choice determined whether his three sons and their wives were saved from the flood that God brought. That was an important choice. But the people outside the ark made a choice. They walked by that thing day by day. The Bible teaches us that Noah preached for 120 years. The judgment of God was coming and those people made a choice to disregard that message, to pay no attention to it. And they drowned in the flood. The Bible teaches us that Abram made a choice. God called Abram out of Ur of Chaldees and he said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And Abram made a choice to leave his family and to follow God and do what God told him to do in life. And God blessed Abraham from that. And he is now the father of, the, of those of faith and the head of the nation of Israel. We move on through Lot's life and there comes a man by the name of Lot. And one day they have strife between their herds and Abraham basically laid out, we're going to make a choice here. And he said, you take the right hand, I'll take the left. You take the left, I'll take the right. And the Bible said Lot lifted up his eyes under the well-watered plains of Sodom and Gomorrah and he chose that place. That was a devastating choice. That choice at that point in his life where he thought, I'm making a wise financial choice. This is going to be good for my family. This is going to really help us financially. I'm going to, we're going to really go forward from here. But he made a choice that literally cost him all of his family. He lost his wife. He lost his daughters. He lost everything by a simple choice he made one day on the side of a mountain. You're making choices today. As your pastor, it's incumbent upon myself to think about the choices that I make. It's incumbent upon me to preach to you. Be careful about your choices and make sure those choices are in line with the word of God. Some of you are making choices about how you're going to discipline your children. You're making choices of how you're going to train and educate your children. Those choices are going to determine destiny, I promise you. Karen and I, Karen and I are visiting this week with each other about some choices that she and I made 30 some years ago. We've been through a lot of battles and through a lot of trouble. But oh, I tell you, I thank God for the grace of God for the choices that he enabled us to make. For they have brought such rich rewards. They have brought life that we would have never known. And I bless God for the grace of God and the influence of God's word and the choices that we made concerning our marriage, concerning our children, concerning education, concerning their training, concerning what we'd expose them to, to the things we would not expose them to. And the things that we would do with our family. I thank God for that. I tell you, we go down the road and there's Isaac. He made a choice to trust and honor his father in the selection of his wife. He made a choice. I'm going to trust my dad. And his dad sent his servant after Rebecca. And the Bible tells us repeatedly, watch this. That in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That in Isaac shall thy seed be called. 
It was because a young man made a choice to honor his father in a major life decision. Some of you young people, the greatest choice you're going to make outside of salvation is the choice of your spouse. And by the way, girls, you have a choice. They said to Rebecca, we'll th- go with this man. She had the choice of going with him or not. Did you ever think about this? She had never seen that boy. She didn't have a clue what he looked like. She didn't know what his personality was like. But she trusted the Lord. She believed that God was leading her to marry that person. I am telling you, choices are important. When your mom and dad talks to you, when the old your pastor talks to you, when people's trying to, God's put people in your life to make choices, you want to listen. Don't disregard those people that God has put in your life. Sarah, Abraham's wife, made a choice one day. It didn't look like God was going to do what, she was, what he had promised. And so she thought, I'll come up with a way. And the Bible said a barren woman was never satisfied and she was wanting a child. But I want to tell you something. Be careful about moving ahead with your choices. For Sarah made a choice to take a handmaid by the name of Hagar and give her to her husband and have a child through him. And Abram made a choice to take her up on it. And can I tell you that you and I are today are living with that choice. Your Muslim nations, your Arabic nations, the, Is- the Ishmaelite people. And it was a curse on Abram, a- a- Abraham and Sarah from that day forward because of a choice she made one day in her house. You say, all well, the choices I'm making are private and they don't affect anybody else. Yes, they do. They're going to affect a lot of people for good or for bad. Jacob made a choice to deceive his father. He didn't have to. His mother gave him ill advice. Let me tell you something. God says to obey your father and mother, but that does not include disobeying God. That does not include violating the word of God. And he could have appealed to his mother and said, Mom, I don't want to be a liar and a deceiver to my own dad. Mom, you ought not be counseling me to deceive my father, your husband. Can I tell you something, ladies? Don't ever ever get involved in your children hiding things from daddy. Don't make choices like that. It's a bad choice. Jacob made a choice to deceive his father. And the rest of his life he lived being deceived. Let's think about this. One day his sons came in with a dirty, bloody coat. And said, is this Joseph's coat? And he said, no doubt it is. But they were deceiving him. And for many, many years, he lived in the deception of believing that his son Joseph was dead. If you follow Joseph's life, he reaped that choice that he made of deception. He was deceived after time, after time, after time. He lived his life being deceived by people. Can I tell you something? Be careful about the bloody, dirty coat that people bring you talking. That coat may not be all it appears to be. And if you take that deception, you will find out that the rest of your life, you're on a course of deception and you will reap what you've sowed by sowing deception. Esau one day came in. He had been hunting. He was hungry and tired. Jacob offered to buy his birthright. He said, what's this birthright going to do me anyway? And he sold his birthright out for a pot of beans, we might say, for nothing. For one meal, he sold his birthright out. He made a choice to sell out. Can I say to you young people here, I don't know when the Lord's coming back, but I want to tell you one thing about this old soldier. I'm not retiring. I'm more excited about serving God than I've ever been in my life. There are some exciting days ahead. And I want to tell you young people, I am not going to sell my birthright. I'm not going to sell it out for a pot of beans and just for temporary pleasure. Let me tell you young people, your your mom and dad, you listen to me well this morning have brought you into this church to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ presented to you and the, and the word of God given to you. And you have a birthright. Every person in the world actually has a birthright. You have a right to be born again, a child of God. You can sell that birthright out if you want to. You can say, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go out here and, and I'm going to party and I'm going to do my life and live my life and I'm selling it out. You'll make a bad choice. But you know what the Bible said Esau did in the New Testament? It tells us that he came to repent with bitter tears, but it was over. He had done made his choice. It was too late. Kids, I'm going to tell you something. This week I visited an educational institution. And I read the history of this educational institution. 
about some choices some people made. I read about back in the 70s when students were marching and burning. When they were streaking. When they were doing drugs. And how this school stood against all that. And how it was mocked. And how the leaders of that school were scoffed. And how they were blasphemed in newspapers. But they stood. And now I see how God has blessed them for that stand. They made a choice not to cave in. Somebody came into the campus one day and said to a young man who was working over on the grass and said, they're burning buildings all across the campuses of America. Is anybody burning any down here? And he made this statement. He said, can I tell you something? When you help build buildings, you don't help burn them. You're making choices whether to cave in. And what I'm saying is this to you kids. Many of you have mom and dads that have homeschooled you. And they've sacrificed a lot of things that they could have done. To give you a godly, Christ-centered education. Don't you sell your birthright. They come up here four days a week and they open these doors so kids can walk in there. Here's something besides that you came from a monkey. To hear something besides that America was founded by a bunch of slaveholders and other lives. Just this week, Bloomington, Indiana has decided that they will no longer call it Columbus Day or Good Friday. It's going to be spring holiday and fall holiday. Why? Because they've been educated to believe lies. And I'm saying to you, you have a birthright in this church. Don't you go out there and sell your soul out to those liberals. They'll cut your guts out when they're done with you. After they've persuaded you to follow their ungodly line, they'll cut your ears off and hold you up as a trophy like they did Saul with his head off in the temple of Dagon. Don't you sell out. Don't you make a choice one day to say, well, I'll tell you what. I went to that church and Reggie, he preached and he didn't always have the good attitude. And my mom and dad didn't let us do that. And my mom and dad wouldn't let us do that. You're some of the most blessed kids in the entire globe this morning to be able to have the opportunity that you have to get a Christian education, wherever mean that may be. And to have some mom and daddies who, by the very fact that they come to this church, have taken a stand in this community that they're going to stand for Jesus Christ. Don't sell your birthright out. Then there's Joseph's brethren. Joseph's coming down through the field one day. And they made a choice to hate him. And that hateful choice made a choice to throw him in a pit. And that hateful choice made a choice to throw him, to sell him. And you know what they lived with? It was a guilty conscience. There was a never a day in their life that they got up. They did not have any peace. Every day of their life, they lived with a guilty conscience made by that choice. I've got to stop and say something. I've been meaning to say this for a week and a half now. Kenny, are some of your ball players here? Kenny took the boys up to St. Louis to what was it, a, a, a tournament up there, and they won first place. Where are you boys at? Stan, would you? Come on, boys. Jump. Let's move. Come on. Don't, don't, we got, we're, we're in the Lord's service. I want to honor you boys. I want to tell you something. Kenny, stand up with them. I want to tell you something. I, I, don't hear anything but, I don't hear anything but good reports on these boys. Come on, R.A. Get in the game here, man. <laughs> I, want to, I want to give these boys a hand of appreciation. This, this is not to glorify sports. These boys are going to get out of high school. And they're going to go on down the road. But you know what? They're making some choices about what kind of men they're going to be. And I want to say publicly to Kenny, I'm telling you, I've watched this guy go through ball games that I would have lost my head and pulled the team off the court and got in the truck and went home on. But he's, I've never seen him lose his cool. Now, he may have, but I've never seen him lose his cool. And I'm going to tell you something. Everywhere, everywhere, it's a testimony for Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, boys, you go on that court, you make a choice that you're going to hold your spirit. That when you get caught bad calls, when you get done dirty, when, you're, when your body's not performing like you wanted it to, and when it didn't look like it's going to work, that you're still going to do this for Jesus' sake. You can be seated, but I just want to honor these boys and Kenny and the coaches today for what they've done. Because there's choices being made in these boys' lives right now.
As I said, it's not to honor necessarily some kind of sports or nothing like that. Not to make heroes out of boys. Because I'm going to tell you something, boys. When ball season's over with and you graduate, you're going to find out life gets a lot tougher. You better be enjoying these days. Amen? Some of you graduates can already say that. Isn't that right? But Joseph made it. Then Joseph's brother made a choice and they wound up living with a guilty, guilty conscience. But then here's something I want you to get a hold of. Joseph was sold down into Egypt by his own brothers. And he made some choices. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The Bible doesn't. The Bible is silent in some places. And the Bible is silent in many of Joseph's years. Brother Terry, I really can't make myself believe that Joseph never struggled with bitterness. A lot of people talk that, well, Joseph, he got past it and he did. But I'm going to tell you something. I believe there were years when he struggled with that bitterness. You can't tell me that he was being marched through the sands down through the Sinai in, in, in chains and fetters and wondering what on earth is God doing in my life. But here's the thing I want to say to you. Those were years of choices. And in the end, Joseph chose not to be bitter. Now listen to me well. He made a decision. He made a choice that though life has handed me lemons, I'm going to make lemonade out of it. He made a choice that when he was lied on by Potiphar's wife and put in prison, that he wouldn't go around glum and beating his fist against the jail cell all day and cussing and planning how he's going to kill everybody when he got out of there. No, he walked in and looked at other men and said, why well, look you so sadly today? And God used Joseph and he made choices. I want to tell you something. Who was it preached? The, the pastor from Georgia just preached that life on Joseph about the pit and the prison and the palace. And it's the choices that you make when you're in the pit and the choices that you make when you're in the, pal- in, in the prison that's going to determine whether you ever have a shot at the palace or not. And I want to encourage you this morning, make a choice that you're going to forgive people. You say, Reggie, I tried, didn't work. Next week, I was still feeling bad about them. Do it again. You say, well, I tried the second time, Reggie. Do it again. What did Jesus tell the apostle Peter? 70 times seven. Again and again and again and every day of your life, wake up and make a choice that you're not going to be bitter, that you're not going to, that you're, that you're going to forgive, that you're going to love, that you're going to see that God is going to mean it for good when they might have meant it for evil, no matter who it is, what it is in your life that happens. Because I am telling you, life is a bunch of prunes apart from Jesus Christ. But when we make right choices, life can turn into a blooming flower. I'm telling you something. I don't know why God has put such faith in my heart. I wish I could share with the church this morning where I think God is leading us, what God is wanting to do through this church. But I'm not at liberty yet, but I will before long. I'm still praying. Okay. If God gives me the green light. I'll, I guarantee you. I'll give, I'll show you. But what I'm saying is this, we've got to make choices. D- Joseph chose not to be bitter. He chose to forgive. He chose to believe that all things do work together for good to them that love the Lord. He chose to be cheerful while he was in prison. He chose to flee when he was tempted. And he chose to honor God in his life no matter what happens. In Hebrews chapter 11, Moses made a choice. The Bible said he chose to suffer the affliction of God's people rather than to enjoy the treasures of Egypt for a season. He chose Christ over this world. He chose God over riches. And Moses was a man who continuously watched this, who was bringing other people to a choice. He said on the, in Exodus 32, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come out. You see, there's a principle in the Bible. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters for he'll either serve the one and hate the other or he'll hate the other and serve the other. God says you're going to make choices. Life is about choices. Moses' whole life was a continual basis of choices every day of his life. Choices based upon God's word. In Joshua 24, 15. We have the plaque up in our house, and I'm sure many of you do too. Choose you this day whom you'll serve. Choose you this day whom you'll serve. Young people, I am begging you in Jesus' name, choose now. Choose now. Make up your mind. The conversation I mentioned earlier that Hannah, I had with Hannah. Let me tell you something. If she doesn't have some choices made now, it won't stand when she gets up there. It's the choices made while you're growing up, the convictions that you have now. It will enable you to stand whenever somebody hits you about how intolerant you are and how bigoted you are and how prejudiced you are and how old fashioned you are and how uh, un-American you are. Now it's to the point of where they call you un-American to believe in the Constitution. It's the choices you're making now. What do you really believe? 
Where is your trust? What doctrines do you really embrace? What truths do you embrace? Moses chose, Joshua chose, but Samson chose. Samson had been set apart by God as a Nazarene, but he made some unwise choices. He decided the satisfaction of his flesh was more important than serving God. But let me listen, listen to me well. You know where it got him? It got his blood. They took Samson's eyes out. They hooked him up to a grinder, a grindstone. And they worked him like an ox, grinding corn in the house of the Philistines. Let me tell you something. The same path is for every person who makes the wrong choices concerning morality. Don't do that. God may have mercy and restore you, but I am telling you something. Don't choose your flesh over your spirit. It's a wrong choice every time. The Bible tells us about Ruth. Man, what a choice this was. Here's a young lady whose husband had died. Her mother-in-law is headed back to Israel. She's from a Moabite tribe. That's from a tribe that came out of incest with Lot. A people that were disdained of God for their filth and nastiness and wickedness. But she had saw the evidence of the God of Israel in the life of Naomi. And when Naomi went back, Naomi did this. She said, go back, go back. Listen to what Ruth said. Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. And whether thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. And thy God, my God. She made a choice. I see her there in the sands there at the edge of the city. Her sister goes back. Her, her, her mother-in-law is trying to go back. There's no more sons. There's no future. But something God had put in her heart. Make a choice here. And she made a choice. I'm going to go with you. And she went with her. And I'm going to tell you something. God blessed that choice of faith, trusting God. She didn't have any idea where God was going to take her. She goes up there. She meets a man by the name of Boaz working in his fields. She marries Boaz. They have a child. His name is Obed. And Obed is the father of Jesse. And Jesse is the father of David. And David is the seed of the Messiah. Oh, what choices our lives make. Choices. One turned back. She made a choice to go back. The other said, I'm going with God. Saul made a choice to disobey God. He said, I don't really have to do what God says. I'm going to choose my own way. And it cost him the kingdom. And one of the saddest passages you'll ever read in the Bible was where Saul and his sons were all killed in one day in battle. Because daddy made a wrong choice. Nabal one day was, brought, was, was uh, visited by David's servants. And they said, David, uh, they said, David has guarded your sheep. And, and you're having a sheep shearing. And, and we, we need food and we need sustenance. And David sent us down to ask if you would share in your sustenance. And Nabal said, there be many a man rebel in these days who, you know, f- go away from their master. And the Bible said he, he scorned him and mocked him and, and required him and, and so forth. Basically spit on him. And he made a choice that he shouldn't have made. Now David almost made a choice there that he shouldn't have made. David came down to kill him. He said, I protected this man. There's not been one of his sheep gone. And he said, he spits at me like this. And he came down. And I, but you know what? God killed Nabal for making that choice. God had given, you listen to me, God had given Nabal that wealth and that sustenance to be a blessing to God's people. And Nabal said, I will not. And I'm telling you one thing, God, the Bible said that God turned his heart into a stone and God killed him. He made a choice to revile God's man. The sad part about it is even good men can make bad choices. David made a choice to stay home from the war. He made a choice to take a nap in the afternoon. And the Bible said he got up off his bed and walked down the rooftop and he saw a beautiful woman bathing herself. And right in that moment of time, there was a choice made that forever altered David's life. He sent after Bathsheba and the Bible said he took her. He lay with her. He made a choice that brought him destruction and doom and sadness and grief and misery the rest of his life over a choice one evening at the house. Some of you are going to make a choice whether to hit that button on your computer and watch pornography. It's going to be a bad choice. Some of you are going to make a choice to shut the thing off and say, by God's grace, I will not do this. I will not do this to my God. I will not do this to my wife. I will not do this to my family. I will not do this. 
you're going to have to make a choice. Amnon, a young man, made a choice of a friend whose name was Jonadab. Some of you are choosing friends. You better choose them carefully because the choice of his friend brought his own death. Whenever he wanted to be with his half-sister Tamar, it was his friend Jonadab who carved out the excuse and the way he could do it. And it was Jonadab who brought his death later on when Absalom killed, killed him at a family picnic. Absalom made a choice that he would never forgive his daddy for what he considered to be fault in his parenting. Absalom made a choice to hate and not to forgive and not to give vengeance to God. One of the worst choices you and I will ever make is to not let God have vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And if you and I try to take it, we become thieves. We're guilty of stealing that which belongs to God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Absalom stole God's vengeance. And it brought him to a point where his hair caught in an oak. And there Joab, the law, put three or ten darts in his, in, 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 three darts in him. And he was buried there. One of the greatest stories of a person in the Bible who made a choice was Esther. Esther was a slave girl taken into captivity. She was an orphan taken in by her aunt and uncle. She was brought into the king's chamber as a potential bride and eventually became the king, the queen. But there's one thing she hadn't done the whole time. She had never told anybody she was a Jewish girl. There came a time whenever her uncle Mordecai found out that Haman was planning on slaughtering and killing and exterminating all the Jews of Persia. Mordecai went into Esther and he said, Esther, you've got to go in and appeal for your people. Well, you didn't go in there unless you were asked. And if you went in without being asked and the king didn't raise the scepter, they'd kill you on the spot. And she basically rationalized with her uncle about it. But there came a point where one day she said, if I perish, I perish. But I'm going in. She made a choice, a tough choice. She could have kept quiet and lived and watched God's people be slaughtered. But she made a choice to die if she needed to be. And she went in. And I'm going to tell you something. God blessed that choice. And forever and forever, people like Ruth and Esther are counted in high esteem because of the simple choices they made, even though they may have been tough. Mordecai, her uncle, made a choice one day. When Haman came down through the street and told everybody to bow, he would not bow because he was a Jew and knew that he was to worship God and only God. He made a choice, a tough choice. Some of you young people are going to go places and you're going to find out there's choices. They're going to try to make you bow. And they're going to try to make you bow by keeping quiet like they wanted Esther to be quiet. Don't share your faith. Don't say who you are. Don't talk about what you believe. Keep quiet. I was so, I'm so saddened. I don't know. One side of my heart pours out for teachers and educators. And the other side of my heart grieves to death. When I hear them making statements, well, I can't talk about God in my classroom. What it really says to me that they're more concerned about their paycheck than they are their faith. Somebody's going to have to stand up in the schools of America and say, no longer are you going to tell me I can't talk about my faith. Somebody's going to have to be willing to be fired. Some school is going to have to be willing to have the federal funds taken away from them. Somebody's going to have to stand up someday and say, you're not stealing our faith from us no longer. Somebody's going to have to stand. Somebody's going to have to make a choice between money, public approval, favor, friends, and the Lord. Job made a choice in the darkest hour of his life that he would not curse God, but that he would bless the Lord. Elijah was a man of choice. Elijah said, how long halt you between two opinions? If Baal is Baal, then serve him. But if God is God, then serve him. That's where we're at in America right now. We have the Baalistic gods of education and humanism, multiculturalism, Globalism, we need to make a mind who we're going to serve. 
Your forefathers made up their mind to serve God Almighty. They didn't serve Europe. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three young men, they were told to bow when the music played. Young people across America are still being told to bow when the music plays. And the God of ungodly music has so moved across our land where it not only is outside the church, but now we're supposed to bow inside the church. Churches across this county and across the counties of the country have bowed down to have the rock groups come into their stages and all the contemporary gospel music and preacher after preacher and church after church has bowed down. But you know what? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went through the furnace. But there was somebody with them. And his name was Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. You know as well as I do this morning that if you make a choice to stand by Jesus Christ, you're going to go through the furnace too. You're going to go through the furnace of ostracization, of mocking, of scorning. You're going to go through the accusations uh, that, you're, that you're not loving, that you're not kind, that you're mean, that you're, you're uncompassionate. You're going to go through those things. If there's ever been a time in my life when it's on full dress parade, it's on full dress parade in the news media right now. It's just fine for the Democrat Party to put a Muslim who's been connected with CAIR, who is connected with Muslim terrorists that's on our terrorist watch list. It's okay for them to put him in as the head of the Democratic National Chairmanship. But it's not okay for Jeff Jeff Sessions, a Christian man, who has stood for godly and wants to guard the borders of this nation and have the order of law. Oh, he's a terrible, the worst, you know what the worst sins in America are this morning? Racist. Let me tell you, that is not a sin according to the Bible. Are you listening to me? Now you're going to have to make up your mind. You're going to call God a racist because he told the Jewish people not to mix and mingle with the heathen? You won't need to get a backbone, friend. You're going to need to grow a backbone. Sexist. If you don't believe in global climate, you're an idiot. If you don't believe in global warming, you're an idiot. And you're being cowed down and intimidated. And you're going to have to make up your mind. What do I believe? You're going to make some choices. Some choices. Because if you don't make a choice for God, you're going to get swept down the river with all this other garbage. Daniel made a choice. He was told not to pray, but he prayed. Oh, bless God. Isn't that wonderful? Getting thrown the lines then wasn't wonderful. You can say what you want to, but Daniel didn't know that that God was going to have an angel down there. The best Daniel knew that when he throwed in there, that was the end of the road for him physically. But you know, God put an angel in there. And when you go into lines den of this world, God will have an angel with you, even if it brings to physical death. Daniel was, had made a choice to pray and to serve God anyway. It took, and Daniel's forever been known as a man of courage and a man of greatness because of the choice that he made. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. The Bible said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. That I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, listen to it, choose life. That both thee, both thou and thy seed may live. This verse is used oftentimes in the debate over abortion, but it's so true. And I, I want to say, I'm, I don't care if you like it or don't like it. Hannah, I want to tell you, your dad's proud of you. Your pastor's proud of you for standing against that junk the other day. They throw the worst garbage at her they could possibly throw at her. And she stood and she didn't cave in. And that's what your mom and I have been after all these years. And oh, you listen to me, Hannah, I love you. And I'll always love you, but I'm telling you something. Stand, because I don't think you've seen any fire yet. You're going to have to make some choices along the way of life. But God will honor those choices. Psalms 119.30. David said, I have chosen the way of truth. You say, Reggie, I've made some bad choices. Listen to me good. I've made some terrible choices. David did too. But you know what? There was a man came to him one day by the name of Nathan the prophet. And Nathan confronted him with his sin. 
And David made a choice to repent. And he made a choice to agree with God that he had done wrong. And he made a choice to no longer try to cover his sin and hide it and justify it and rationalize it. But he repented. And you read David cry out, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out all my transgressions. I want you to listen to me today. You may be in this building and you've made some terrible choices in the past. But if you'll go to God and make a choice now to say, Dear God, I want your forgiveness. I want your mercy. You'll make a choice to be truthful with God and truthful with yourself. God will take that second choice. And God's a God of second chances and third chances and thousand chances. And it all has to do with your choices. Can I tell you, some of the people who have sinned the worst in the Bible, God used the greatest. It's choices. David said in Psalms 119, 173, I have chosen thy precepts. Isaiah 7, 15 says, choose the good. Proverbs 16, 16 says, choose understanding rather than silver. Proverbs 1, 29, choose the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 22, 1, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. When you get into the New Testament in Matthew chapter 7, the Bible tells us, Jesus told us there was a broad road and a narrow road. And he's telling everyone, you're going to take one or two of these roads. He said that narrow road, there's not many people on it, but it leads to life. He said that broad road, there's a lot of folks on it, but it leads to destruction. I wonder which road you've chosen this morning. The narrow road of the cross or the road of the world. You're going to make a choice. In Matthew chapter 7, God said that there's two ways that you can build. You can choose how you're going to build your life. You can build it on the sands of this world's unbelief and this world's sin. Or you can build it on the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the, de- and the decision and the choice that you make on this issue right here will determine whether your house stands when the storms of life come. If we are building this church on the rock of Jesus Christ, all the gates of hell cannot prevail against this church. We are not building this church on the sands of denominationalism. We're not building this church on the sands of of social acceptance. We are building this church upon the rock of God's word and the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I tell you today that this work and this church will stand because it's being built on the Lord Jesus Christ. And your home will stand if you build it on Jesus Christ and the word of God. And your family will stand if you build it on the rock. I've been so amazed. Van talked about this last week. But I, listen, I watched some interviews on some of the college campuses. What was your reaction to the election? Great big boy. You know, looked like he had had about 42 more sacks of potato chips than he should have had. But anyway, I cried. They're bringing dogs in. They're bringing Play-Doh in to college students. They're bringing Legos in. They're bringing Play-Doh in. They're bringing extra counselors in to deal with their grief at the election. You know something? I never saw a kid in this church house that needed Play-Doh when Obama got elected. We just girded up our loins and said, God's in charge. We're still going to serve God and preach the gospel. I didn't get a bunch of Play-Doh for our kids at school to have a grease session on. If I had them, I'd tell you how to throw that stuff across the street. Amen. Get your head in your book and get back to studying and serve God and let's go. Amen. I never saw, you know why they're doing that? You know why their world crumbles? It's because they build it on the government checks and not on Jesus Christ. Amen. They have not built their life on the one who will never fail them. Amen. There's a choice that was made at Calvary. There were two men on each side of Jesus Christ. And each of those men made a choice. One man made a choice to look at Jesus and say, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The other made a choice to scoff and mock. One went to hell and one went to paradise, went into heaven. You're going to make a choice at Calvary. Which side of the cross are you on? You're going to make choices about eternity. There's two places. There's heaven and there's hell. And you're going to choose where you go. There's Christ and there's Satan. You're going to choose who you serve. There's life and there's death. And you're going to choose which one. There is blessing and there is cursing. And you're going to choose what you get. There's truth and there's lies. 
And you're going to choose what you believe. I was astounded at Brother Bradley's statement this morning. I appreciate it. Because the choices we make about whether something is the truth or not is going to determine a lot of things that happen in our life. You're going to choose the church or you're going to choose the world. Demas, Paul said, made a choice. He hath forsaken me because he loved this present world. No man, Jesus said, can serve two masters. You will serve one or the other. I want to speak to you in closing this morning this. You're going to choose as you go along on your spiritual journey to either give up or to keep going. One of the greatest things ever happened to me was done to me by my brothers and I thought they were mean at the time. But whenever I'd get in a fight, they told me, if you give up, we'll whip you worse. So you know what? You just kept fighting. And you know, when the devil's fighting me, I always remember that. They would always say this, never say give. Don't ever say give. Don't ever say give. Jack Hiles, he, a lot of people hates him. A lot of people loved him. I loved him. I loved to listen to him preach. I'm sure he didn't do any, a lot of things right. One day it came out in the national news story that Jack Hiles' son had committed adultery. Isn't that right? National news. Biggest church in America. Fundamentalist. Bible thumpers. And his boy, a preacher in Texas, had left his wife and run off with another woman. And the church didn't know what they were going to do. Jack Hiles had a choice to make. He could either fold his head in his hands and weep and cry and shake and say, it's not been worth it, I'm done. But he walked into that congregation in Hammond, Indiana, walked behind the pulpit that morning, and he began to sing. Everything's all right in my father's house. In my father's house. In my father's house. Everything's all right in my father's house. Did you know something this morning? Everything is just fine in our father's house. It's just fine. And he knew that life had storms. And he grieved and it hurt. But he didn't give up. If I wouldn't love Jack Hiles for any other reason, and I'll have people who listen to this over the internet go, well, I'll do what I'm done listening to him. If he likes Jack Hiles, go help yourself. <laughs> I can't preach without my flesh coming out a little bit, can I, sister? Jack Hiles, when I was a young preacher, said this. You go cut the word quit out of your dictionary. Amen. You go cut the word quit out of your dictionary. Quit should not be in your vocabulary. I'm not making a recommendation to you. Just slipping this in. There's a movie out. It's called... Hacksaw Ridge. It's about a boy who was a Seventh-day Adventist. And he saved 75 men on the island of Okinawa. It's a true story. He drug 75 wounded American soldiers off the battlefield after our soldiers had left. And after each one, he would say, Lord, just give me one more. Lord, give me one more. Do you know what he wouldn't do? Because he had convictions, he wouldn't quit. You're going to make some choices in life. You're going to give up, you're going to keep going. You're going to give in when the pressure comes, you're going to stand alone. Kids, are you going to make up your mind to study hard? Or are you just going to flop through school? You've got a choice to make. I'm glad my dad made that choice for me. As if they get my, my rear end beat off or make good grades. You know, there are some times when you need help making choices. <laughs> but you know what, really? My dad doing that, in the course of time, he put something in me. I tell you what, I made up my mind. I want to do the best I could. I was in the middle of my high school. I was a sophomore in my high school, freshman in that area, and I was just slopping through school. Doing no more than I had to do to get by. But one day something happened inside me, and I made up my mind. I'm going to make the very best grades I can make. You know something? I want that to happen to you kids. Some of you are in homeschool. Some of you are being here at the Christian school. 
You're going to make a choice. You're making choices right now. I beg you in Jesus' name, make a choice to be the very top grade point average student you can make with the best attitude that you can have. Being the blessing to as many people as you can be on the course of it. You're going to make a choice to do your best or just enough to get by. You're going to make a choice to smile or to frown and look glum. You're going to make a choice to hope or to go into despair. You're going to make a choice to believe or to doubt the promises of God. You're going to make a choice to do right or to do wrong. You're going to make a choice to live in fear or to have courage and believe God against all odds. You're going to make a choice to be bitter or to forgive, to hate or to love. And you're going to make choices to worry about things or trust God with it. You're going to make a choice to fight the good fight of faith or to surrender. You're going to make a choice whether to be humble or proud and cocky. You're going to make a choice to complain or to be grateful. You're going to make a choice to be glad or sad. And you're going to make a choice to walk with God or walk with the world. You're going to make some choices whether to serve or to be served. You're going to make a choice to defile and poison or to refuse to listen and to believe to poison. You're going to make a choice to love this world or love the Lord. Where will you spend eternity today? Right now, based upon the choices you have made, the choice that you've made, where, would you, where will you be? What kind of person do you want to be? What have you made up your mind that you want to be? You want to be a blessing to your dad and mom? Be a blessing to this church? Be a blessing to God? Be a help to this country? Let me tell you something. There's a train moving out of the station. Don't fail to get on it. Don't get left behind. I'm going to tell you something. God has given this nation a window of opportunity. We're going to need thousands of young people who got their head on right and their heart in the right place and who are not afraid to lay their hand to the, to the, to the hoe. You're going to make choices. What kind of friends are you going to choose? What kind of spouse are you going to choose? Tonight, tonight we're going to have a wide open service. We're going to talk about choosing spouses, choosing jobs. What's the basis of making a choice? We're going, to put up, we're going to put certain decisions that have to be made. And where do you go in the Bible to find how to make a decision for that? That'll be tonight. You're going to be involved. I'm not preaching. I'm just going to kind of orchestrate the service. Let me listen to you. Listen to me. You're going to make a choice about what kind of church you're going to attend. Somebody says, well, it doesn't really matter, Reggie. Yes, it does matter. Yes, it does matter. Churches teach things or they don't teach things. Churches have doctrine or they don't have doctrine. It does make a difference where you go to church. You're going to make a decision about what Bible you use. You're going to make a decision about what kind of music is going to be in your life. You're going to make choices about movies or entertainment. You're going to make choices about the doctrines that you believe. You're going to make choices about how you dress and how you appear and how you represent the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're going to make a choice about your disposition, your attitude, your motives. And so forth. What is it that you want to be like? You're going to make choices about who you will emulate. I'm going to tell you girls something. Miley Cyrus is nobody for you to emulate. You're going to emulate or make patterns after who will it be? Who's going to be your heroes in history and culture? I was at this educational institution this week. As I walked down through the halls, I saw the pictures of people that they've had come speak at that campus. I saw Margaret Thatcher. I saw Benjamin Netanyahu. By the time I got to the end of the hallway, I knew where that school stood. They didn't have one liberal ever come speak to that campus. Now, they did have Joseph Kennedy come and debate Alan Keyes. I bet that would have been a a basket deal. But continuously, they had people come. Coaches. Generals who upheld the traditional American patriotic values and speak to those kids. You're going to make choices about who you eliminate. Who's going to be your heroes? You're going to make choices. Are you going to stay with your spouse? Are you going to leave them? You're going to make a choice if you're going to keep your vows or forsake them. 
You're going to make a choice to stay in church or let the devil take you out. You're going to make a choice as to how your children will be educated and with what curriculum and what basis. You're going to make a choice who's going to be the head of your home. I want to tell you men something. Listen to me tight. I'm not, I'm not smart. And I'm not spiritual. But I'm not stupid. There is a pattern over 30 years of pastoring that I have seen the prime mover has been the wife getting people out of church. Amen. Behind the scene was a man who wouldn't stand. I'm going to tell you men something this morning you need to hear. You need to make up your mind where God wants you in church. And then if your wife jumps up and starts dialoguing everybody and malicious and everybody in church and the preacher on down, you need to say, honey, I love you and I'll never leave you. But shut your mouth right now. We're not having that in this home. We're not having it. And if she says, I ain't going no more, you say, honey, I'm going and you're going to be out of the will of God if you don't go with me. You can stay home or you can go what you do want you. And I'm not going to whoop you over it, although you probably should, should get a whooping. But I'm going to church. And you're never going to accuse me of not leading this family with the Lord. Amen. Men, listen to me. And you ladies, listen to me. You ladies, don't let the devil get in you. It's serious business. It will chart the course of your family's history if you men don't lead the home and lead in righteousness. You have a choice this morning. Will you repent or rebel? Receive Christ or reject Christ? Pilate had a choice. What shall I do with this man called Christ? He made a bad choice. The people had a choice. Christ or Barabbas? They wanted Barabbas. You're going to make a choice concerning Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop right here. We're going to pick this up tonight and we're going to go into a practical discussion about the importance of decision making and we're going to put out illustrations and so forth tonight, things that we need to decide about and where from the Bible. Do we make choices? Reggie said that's not a basis for you making a choice. The Bible is your basis for making choices. We're going to do this tonight. Hope you'll come back. But let's just pray. Father in heaven, we ask now, Lord, that you would take this message and use it for your glory and for the good of folks across the world. I pray, God, that you'll put the solemnity of this message in my heart. That even today and tomorrow and all week long, I'm going to be making choices. I'm going to be making choices whether to smile when I get up or look like I've just lost my last dog. I'm going to be making choices, Lord, whether it be pleasant to Karen or gripey. I'm going to be making choices, Lord, whether to move forward or sit down. And God, I'm going to be making choices whether to talk to somebody about the Lord. I'm going to be making choices about honesty and business. And God, I'm asking you today, oh, Holy Spirit of the living God, fall upon us. That we would consider carefully and judiciously our choices. And that we would be sure that our choices are lined up with the word of God. Lord, you know sometimes it's hard to know. Give us patience to wait till you show us as you did Samuel. And Lord, I pray that the families of this church, and those who hear this message, would be blessed by Lord taking and laying these things to heart that the choices they make are going to determine destiny. I pray that you'll be honored and glorified through it. And I mean it, Lord, in Jesus' name. As our heads are bowed and eyes closed this morning, I want to ask you today, if you're here and you're not saved, would you make a choice and pray in your heart right now, dear Lord, I'm coming to you for salvation. I'm choosing life. I'm choosing Christ. I'm choosing to receive him as my savior. I'm receiving him now, Lord. I am making a choice. I'm not going to walk out of this church having chosen the devil, having chosen this lost world. I'm going to choose heaven through Jesus Christ. 
Let me tell you something. Salvation is in its final analysis a choice of what you're going to believe, where your faith and trust is going to be placed. I am asking you in Jesus' name, I beg of you for the eternal destiny of your soul. Make a decision right now. I realize that Satan will give you a thousand lies right now. He'll give you a dozen excuses why you should put it off and say not now. Please, I beg you, if the Holy Ghost of God is dealing with you, he doesn't owe you another chance. He doesn't owe you another opportunity. If he's dealing with you now about this choice, this is what God said in Deuteronomy 3. Choose life. I set before you this day death and life. Choose life that thou and thy seed may live. I ask you to do that today. Ask Jesus to save you. Believe on his death, burial, and resurrection. God will save you. He said, all that come to me, I will no wise cast out. And may I say to you today, he not only is able to save you to the uttermost, he is able to keep you to the end. You might say, I'm afraid to be saved. I don't know how to live. I'm afraid I couldn't live it. I understand that and God does too. But he saves you not on the basis of how well you live it. He will give you grace each day. Trust him. Trust him. There are people in this building today, you're saved. You've got important decisions to make. They're coming down the pike. You're going to choose something. I beg you in Jesus' name today, ask God to give you wisdom and grace. And plead with the Lord to give you of his mighty spirit to make the right choices. To give you the patience that Samuel had. When there's nothing in front of you that looks like the choice, that you'll still wait on God and not compromise. If you're here today and you've made a choice to receive Christ as your Savior, would you indicate that today by an uplifted hand? Just an uplifted hand. I've chosen the Lord today as my Savior. Anywhere in this building, quickly before we dismiss, I know it's late, I've preached long. Anywhere in this building, by an uplifted hand, hold it up high. I've chosen Christ today as my Savior. Let's stand together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day. I pray, God, that you'll bless this message to the hearts of these people. Strengthen them. Use it, Lord, for your glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.